What's going on, everybody, and welcome back to the channel. Now, today, we are back here with a different style sort of video here. We're going to be focusing in on one particular cricketing nation and talking about their upcoming schedule, their previous matches. And honestly, I find the West Indies such a fascinating topic at the moment in the cricket world, of course, just coming off beating Australia um, in a day-night test match, the first time any country's ever done that. That. We know the scenes, we know the repercussions really from that and, and the vibration effect that goes back to the West Indies and just invigorates their cricket community that little bit more and maybe they're building towards something quite special here. It's been a really interesting turnover of, you know, a lot of experienced players have essentially been shown the door and kicked out in the last three to five years. They're now introducing a lot more youth and more excitement back into the cricketing nation that is the West Indies. So, hey, if you're new around here, hit that subscribe button, leave a like, and comment down below which country I should go in depth of next. I want to start doing this series where I just focus on one country, their players, their stats, their schedule, and what's kind of coming up or what we expect of this certain playing nation. So, hey, subscribe if you're new. I said that. Let's get into the video. The West Indies, we're going to start off just going through the upcoming games. But actually, I want to touch, it goes back a little bit further after they've now, where are we up to? Hold on. I need to find where I was actually trying to talk about. So just here, this is where I wanted to, to get to and start here. So the T20 World Cup of 2022, they've been quite inconsistent honestly since what i mean 2019 really they've kind of been this downward spiral since winning the 2016 world cup we know the legends who were a part of those teams even going back further into the test atmosphere the legends of Kurtley Ambrose, Vivian Richards, uh, Malcolm Marshall. You guys know what I'm talking about. Well, Brian Lara, Chanderpaul, those sorts of legends. But they've fallen away. And now to see them have this big win and, and find some excitement in their cricket again. So I want to talk about where the last year and a half has been for them. We're going to do this quickly. The T20 World Cup last year lost to Scotland in their first game. Just beat Zimbabwe got beaten by Ireland and that was their T20 World Cup. They were done straight away after that. And I think even that was after not qualifying for the World Cup in 2021 and maybe 2020 or did we skip that year? I think we did. So I think it was 2021. They didn't even qualify in their best format, which was so disappointing. They fall out of the World Cup very easily in 2022. They then go into a two-match test series that year to end the season against the Aussies. They get pumped in both matches, which to think about, it's been pretty much a year, just over a year since this test series today. And to think a year and a bit later, they've now beaten Australia in a test match who no one thought that was coming. Like, look at these results. They were punished and they brought out a, a, just a terrible 11 back then. And we keep going more. So then they went on to play Zimbabwe, my former home nation, in two test matches. One was a draw and one was an absolute smashing of Zimbabwe. Means nothing. It's mini our stuff right there. They then play South Africa in a... Two match test series, they lose 2-0. The first test, they are, I want to say comprehensively beaten. Second test match, they are smashed. You move on to an ODI series, the West Indies uh, managed to, to tie the, well, they only played two matches in the end and it was tied one all. So that's a good result for them. Um, I don't, I'm unsure where these were played, but regardless, it was still a good result. T20 series, they end up winning that T20 series 2-1 against South Africa, which is a big way to start 2023. So that's a big scalp to win that. They then play a three-match ODI series against the UAE. I mean, that fucking means nothing to me. They then play Scotland, of course. There was the ODI World Cup last year. So they finished... You know, they, they, let's be honest, they're coming off some pretty good form. You know, they've drew a T20 series. Um, they've lost the Test Series against the Proteas, drew the ODI series, and then won the T20 series. So they're, they're feeling quite confident. They beat the UAE 3-0, whatever. 
They then beat Scotland in the first warm-up game. They then smashed the UAE in the second warm-up game. And you're starting to think maybe things are coming together here um, as you get a little bit further. They, of course, had to play through the group stages because they didn't actually qualify for the World Cup. They had to go through the qualifiers to qualify, if you get what I'm saying. So they just beat the USA. They thump Nepal. They lose to Zimbabwe. They then lose to the Netherlands back to back. They then lose to Scotland. They then beat Oman. And then they lose to Sri Lanka. And they did not qualify for the ODI World Cup of 2023. So that's two of the last three World Cups that they have not qualified for which is sad because this is one of the most exciting cricket nations, not just in the world, but in cricket history. And everyone knows, everyone loves the West Indies, their players, their colours, their jersey, the history behind them. So to not qualify for two out of the last three World Cups would take a big impact on them mentally and their thinking of ability to play good cricket. So you're losing against teams that they shouldn't realistically, they should be qualifying they then play a test series um, and really just a whole tour that India had in the West Indies. I think there's actually a, a review of this entire series on my channel, but essentially it was an interesting series. India went there with a, a much less strengthened team, played test matches, thumped the West Indies in the first match, drew the second one. They then played them in an ODI series, which India ended up winning 2-1. They really did thump the West Indies, except for in this second game. And then in the T20 series, which was not a shock, but it was a big, big scalp this, the West Indies ended up winning the T20 series 3-2. So that was their biggest series win in, I don't know how long it would have been since they beat such a good nation like India, but a massive win for them, kind of put them back on track, gave them a bit of excitement. You know, they've got a drawn series in there. They didn't have a good test series, but then bringing it back, winning the T20s makes you feel confident. Of course, during that T20 series, that's the West Indies best format. That's when they bring back all of their players who actually want to play for the country. Into an ODI series now, we'll just speed this up, ended up winning that 2-1. So they beat India and then they go to England and beat them 2-1 in an ODI series, which is massive. Of course, they then play them in five T20s and the West Indies win their third series in a row which is magical stuff. So they win a T20 series against India, beat England in an ODI series, and then beat England, I believe it was on home soil in England as well. So massive, massive stuff there. 3-2 win. Oh, no, 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 sorry. That was in uh, the West Indies. I do remember watching the highlights for those games now because I remember that Phil Salt, I think, had like two centuries in those games. Um, just a bit of knowledge there. So three series wins in a row. They've got momentum behind them as a nation again. They're starting to win. They're getting back that identity. Um, and then they come to Australia to play a test series, which two test matches, no one was expecting that they would get close in either of them. The first test match was that exactly. They were embarrassed um, and they were completely destroyed in the media. Rodney Hogg actually said that they were hopeless. They were embarrassing. And they took that personally. Clearly, they have a lot of spirit and a lot of pride to play for as a West Indies player. And then we know what happened in the second test match where they ended up beating Australia by eight runs in one of the great test matches in the last decade. But one of the best test matches we will see this year. So they win that, which has been their biggest win in West Indies history in the last, I want to say, since they won the T20 World Cup, it feels like. So massive stuff. Hopefully they can roll on and keep the momentum going. That's the most important thing now because they've got three ODIs against the Aussies. They're playing the champions in their own backyard. Big task ahead. They then play us in three T20 games as well, which is a big task as well for a team that isn't qualifying for World Cups with a T20 World Cup this year, these need to, they need to at least find a win or manage to be quite competitive in these matches because then 
We're into T20 World Cup mode. They're into the warm-up games, the group stages, Papua New Guinea, Uganda. Those are two games they must win and do it very comfortably. And then it puts them, if they can start off with two wins, it puts them in this stage of, okay, we've got two more warm, we've got two more group stages to go. If you can pick a win against Afghanistan, that's three wins. And that's a possibility to go through the next stage, definitely. So there's plenty to play for, for the West Indies. Like they're a team that could definitely do damage at the World Cup, but they have to prepare well and they have to show a good fight now. After winning this test match, they need to do it now in the rest of this white ball series against Australia. And then into the World Cup, they will then go to England to play three test matches, which is a while away. So all of that out of the way, give me your thoughts on their upcoming fixture, the revival of their team. We're now, hold on a minute, what have I touched on? Uh, what's this? That's the third T20, okay. Now we're going to go into their statistics and talk about the entire last year. So the last 12 months from their test team and the T20 team. We're not going to touch on ODIs because there's no ODI World Cup this year, uh, but there's a T20 World Cup. So let's talk about it. Let's go. Let's start off with the test cricket first, just because it's the most traditional format and it's what we love. So let's look at their batting averages. This is every current player for the West Indies and their batting statistics. So Athenaeus, of course, who's probably passed it at this point, bit of an all-rounder, gives you a bit of both. Not much with the batting side of thing. Blackwood and Bonner, who have been around for a while now, played, I know Blackwood, 56 matches, almost 3,000 test runs, an average of 30. I think he's about 30-something. Look, again, they're just trying to prioritize using the young players, um, like Tajnarine, Chanderpool to open. You know, there's just not really a spot for him. Bonner, Eh, like average is 38, but he's just, I think he's a bit older, um, which probably a bit unfair that he didn't play more matches, but is what it is. Craig Braithwaite, the other opener, of course, is still their man at the top, almost up to 100 test matches, um, 5,000 test runs, a 212 high score, and an average of 34 with 12 test hundreds. So by far the most of their current day players, he is still their spiritual leader with bat in hand. Um, you've got some other names amongst it, like Sharma Brooks, Jaden Campbell, I think his name is. The new guy on the block, Tajna Ryan, 207 not out high score. I think that was against Zimbabwe. Uh, an average of 32. So, of course, the son of uh, Shiv Narayan. That's good to see there. Roston Chase, the GOAT, Rakeem Cornwall. Averages 18. He won't be back. Um, and then the wicketkeeper, De Silva, who's averaging 38, a high score of 100 not out. Um, sorry, he's only averaging... Where's his name? De Silva. Oh, he's averaging 26. That's his strike rate. Um, almost at 1,000 runs after 26 matches. Greaves, Hodge, and the rest. The rest of these guys aren't necessarily batsmen. I mean, Joseph has got some runs to his name. Mackenzie and all of that. So you can see where their test match is at. They're kind of, they've got a, a tiny bit of experience and the rest of it is just new players. That's why it was such a big win against the Australians. Into the bowling side, Athenaeus is still there, whatever. Um, Craig Braithwaite, of course, can bowl. And then the rest, like Roston Chase, he's not really a part of their test setup anymore. He's too old and they're just not prioritizing him, which makes sense. Uh, Gabriel, who's obviously, you know, one of their tall paces, right? Um, Greaves, who's new. Hodge is new. Hold has been around forever. Seals, Alzari Joseph, and now Sharma Joseph is a part of that team. You've got Kyle Mayers, who prioritizes white ball cricket now. Kirk McKenzie, Moti, um, and Kemar Roach with Kevin Sinclair at the bottom. So that's really the names to follow on there. Getting into the big thing coming up though, the White Ball World Cup, a T20 World Cup. We know that the West Indies, they play their best team and all of their best players decide, hold on, we actually want to represent our country now when they're playing T20s because we know that most of the West Indies players decide to play T20 competitions across the world instead of playing for their nation. 
whether you decide that's a good reason or not, you tell me. But the money talks, doesn't it? So into the T20 batting side of things, Fabian Allen, of course, I don't think he's a current active player, but they've got plenty to choose from at this World Cup. He's got some runs to his name, a terrible average. Uh, is this Darren Bravo? So he's not really relevant. Neither is Brooks, neither is this guy. Johnson Charles passed it. Roston Chase, is he going to be their all-rounder? Probably not. I think he's like 70. Sheldon Cottrell, I mean, he's, you know, a bowler. Uh, Dominic Drakes, no. Matthew Ford, bowler, I think. Hetmeyer, of course, will be a part of the team. He only averages 20 to Shimron Hetmeyer, but he's got almost a 1,000 runs, a high score of 81. He's got plenty of experience. He will be there. Jason Holder, he will be there. Shy Hope, does he stand at the top of the order? unsure. Um, Akil Hussain, he will be a part of the squad. Of course, is a very trusty all-rounder um, who does work with bat or ball. Alzari Joseph, Brandon King, like you just see the names. Kyle Mayers, we assume, will open at the World Cup. I think he's probably their most destructive top order opening batsman. So if it was me, I'm picking Kyle Mayers. Um, Brandon King's probably still amongst that group, isn't he? Moti, Kyron Pollard, of course. You've got Nicholas Peran, Rom Van Powell, Andre Russell. So you're going to have to fit four to five of those guys in who they come back into the team and demand a spot. So their batting order is pretty solid. It's just going to be that bowling. Does it does it let them down? Obed, McCoy, Moti, uh, Dre Russell, if he's going to bowl, Romero, Shepard, Odin Smith, O'Shane Thomas. Like they've got those names, but just not a whole lot of experience behind it. So it's, it's a very interesting makeup. They've got plenty of decisions to actually decide. Evan Lewis as well. I forgot about Evan Lewis. He might open the batting as well. So they've got options. They've just got too many of them in the T20. So we'll, we'll touch on the last thing here and we'll finish off the video. I've thoroughly enjoyed speaking about this in depth and just kind of given a bit of my own cricket knowledge if you want. I could even, what I might do is I might put together a little best 11 as well for the World Cup. I'll do that um, after this. So the bowling, Darren Bravo, damn it. Oh, is, that, is this Darren Bravo or no, no, that's no, Darren. Um, Sharma Brooks, I mean, does he get a part of it? Probably. Roston Chase is there, Cottrell is a bowler. So you probably imagine Cottrell is a part of that bowling unit, um, Holder, I mean, Ford, do they want to play a young fella in Ford? I'm unsure, but probably not. Um, Akil Hussain, Alzari Joseph, Obed McCoy, Moti, obviously Pollard, probably not bowling anymore, is he? I don't think he... No, I think he's retired anyway, so forget about Kyron Pollard. Uh, and who else? Andre Russell can roll the arm over, but they're going to rely heavily on guys like an Odin Smith, a Shepard, an O'Shane Thomas potentially someone like a Hayden Walsh Jr. Um, I'd be pretty worried about their bowling unit coming into the World Cup. That is definitely their biggest flaw. And they're going to need someone to stand up big time. Maybe they do pick a guy like a Sharma Brooks now who wasn't even in the, probably in the group of players. Now he's right in the mix because of what he did against Australia. So it's raw talent. It's good pace. And I think they'd be silly not to include him. But... That is our recap of the West Indies. I'm now going to put together a little best 11 of what I think for their World Cup team. Injuries and selection, all of that not included. Just what I think is their best team. I will be back. All right, to finish off this video, we're going to run through what is my best 11, I think, if I'm not forgetting anyone for the West Indies T20 World Cup team, obviously injury, selection, um, all of that good stuff. The West Indies, sometimes they do things a bit differently, especially if players haven't dedicated enough time to the international team, they get left out. So with everyone available, I think this is the best 11. Again, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong on positions or what you think would be better. Let's run through it. It's all just subject to opinion and what you think is the best choice. So I've got the man, Kyle Mayers, at the top. I think he is, it's either him or Johnson Charles that will partner Brandon King at the top. 
So, look, uh, Johnson Charles, the man's pushing 40. Kyle Mayers, I think he's low 30s. He's... Good IPL experience, good, um, you know, he's playing in the South African T20 League. He's he's done it a lot more often, in my opinion, than Johnson Charles and would be the most destructive choice, especially on potential flat pitches on home soil and in the USA. So, yeah, that's my choice. Brandon King, that's the easiest one. Again, he, uh, look, he's, it's not that he's fantastic, but he's probably just their only decent choice who has a lot of experience opening up. I don't, and look, they could try something a bit different if they wanted and, and put one of the, those more explosive players up the top, but just doesn't, just doesn't look right to me. So, Nicky Piran at number three, look, you can put him at three, four, five, doesn't matter, but I've got him taking the wicketkeeper gloves. Um, one of the more destructive batsmen in the world when they get going. And he's got good form in the USA. I know that it's also going to be played on their home soil, but the man in the MLC cricket final last year in the USA T20 league, he played for the Mumbai Indians team. I think they were called MI New York. And in the final, he smashed like 150 off like... 50 balls or something. It was just ridiculous. Go look it up. Look up Nicholas Peran MLC um, fucking runs or batting or something like that. He was insane. Easy pick. It'd be good to have him in there. Shy Hope at four. Again, he's sort of that one who can float, but the vice captain obviously is in the team. Shimron Hetmeyer at number five. Now, this is one who could easily not be a part of the, t of the squad. He's chosen pretty much in the last few years to say, I don't care about the West Indies team. I'm just going to play T20 leagues across the world, which is quite disappointing because of how good of a player he can be when he's on. But yeah, I don't look, I think he's going to be there, but it wouldn't surprise me if the selectors say, Hey, you've prioritized T20 leagues over us. You're not playing for us at the World Cup. I can see that happening. He's also, I think there was a time where he, a few years ago, where he actually missed his his plane as well with the team. And then they said, no, undisciplined, you know, it's not disciplined. Hold on. I'll let that out if I can speak properly. Not disciplined enough. Shimron, no, we said that. Dre Russell, we believe, is going to be available. So that's good. Number six. Jason Holder, the captain at number seven. And they bat very deep, which is important. Akil Hussain at number eight, bowl four overs of spin um, and is very handy with the bat. Alzari Joseph, O'Shane Thomas and Moti at number 11. Now, depending on the pitches, of course, they could easily say Hussain or Moti, one of them out only play the one spinner, bowl four overs of spin, and then you get in an extra pace bowler slash all-rounder like Shafane Rutherford, or they could go with the extra pace bowler in someone like a Sharma Joseph or um, who else bowls pace for that country. I'm trying to think. I can't, I can't think of everyone at the moment, but you know what I'm saying, just any pace bowler. Um, what's that guy, that new fella, Matthew Ford, someone like him. I mean, there's there's plenty of options around. They just need to pick someone they think they can believe in and trust. No room for, um, yeah, look, a few players who I think are just on the outer of their careers. And yeah, I think it's a strong 11. I think they can do damage at a World Cup and potentially push for that Super 6. Also, that top four semi-final would be a big change um, in the last few years of what they've done, but I can see it with that team. But that will cap us off. Let me know all of your comments and thoughts down below on the West Indies team. Do you like my best 11? Do you like my deep dive of the Windies? I hope we all enjoyed, and I'll see everyone in the next one.